Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Red Dot Forum Camera Talk. It's been a while. It has been a while. Too long. Too long. If you ask me. I mean, even a day is too long. Josh, is it too long? It is too long. Okay. Well, there. Well, now, we're back. Now, uh, we're back. And we are uh, live on the air uh, after much ado and travel and other things. So You the- would think we would be relaxed from our two and a half month break. But quite the opposite. It, has it really been that long? It's, yeah, September oh 11th gosh. was our last show. Wow. Two and yeah. A half, two and a, yeah, two months and change. So a lot has happened since then, right? Yes, a lot. So what are we going to talk about? Well, first you can introduce yourself. Okay. It's been, it's been a while. I'm a little rusty. <laughs> That's little okay. Rusty. All right. So I am David Farkas. I'm joined by Josh Lehrer. Hey, everyone. Producing the show is Jose Rivera. He's going to wave. Uh, we're having a little bit of a... Mic trouble. Microphone situation. Yeah, the, the studio's still a little bit collect some dust, but we'll we'll work it out. We're 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 taking down the cobwebs. It's all good. It's yeah. all good. All right. Well, uh, I see a lot of people are joining us, which is great. Yes. Um, welcome back to everyone. And uh, it has been a busy couple months here. Yes. Since our last show, there have been tons of updates in the world of Leica news. Indeed. And you have spent the past six weeks traveling. I have. Um, Pretty much nonstop. You were in, where were you? You were in Scotland. Yep. And Ireland. Yep. Germany. Yep. Japan. Yes. And now I'm here. And now you're in Miami. Yes. <laughs> Although my brain is still somewhere, I think, like over the middle of the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> but he's still I, a little jet lagged. So I am very jet lagged, but I'm right. still here. So yeah. so it's been it's been a it's been a chaotic couple of months for the both of us. Yeah. Uh, and now, why was I in Germany? Ah, well, on October 20th, there was the celebration of photography at the factory in Wetzlar. And in addition to the Oscar Barnack Award winners being announced, a couple of major new product announcements came, which will be... What it, What is the topic of tonight's show, Mr. Vargas? We're talking about all the new products that have been launched since we have been on the air. So we've got uh, a rundown here, let's see, of the, the M6, two 35 millimeters, two Q2 Special Editions, and an SL2S reporter and a partridge in a pear tree. Right. Plus, we have new firmware for a bunch of M cameras we and do. a new promotion for the SL system as well, and a couple of new little goodies as to show. So there is a lot to discuss. There is indeed. And I think the way we're going to do this is we're going to start with the special editions that sure. came out. Yeah, yeah. Why not? We'll kind of build our way up to the the things people really want us to talk about, which mm-hmm. I would say are the M6. Uh, the steel rim, mm-hmm. and then the 35 FLE version 2. So we're going to make sure we devote time to that. That sounds reasonable. Um, so let's get started, I think, with the first one that came out, which was the Dawn. That was, when was that released? It was September 21st. So just about 10 days after we aired the last show, like you introduced a special edition of the Q2 called the Dawn. This was a collaboration with the artist Seal, mm-hmm. not the animal Seal, the artist Seal. There we go. Um, <laughs> we can pull it up on the screen. Perfect. And this was limited to how many? 500. And the covering on the camera is a special Japanese silk type of fabric. Each one is different, or was different. They're all sold out now. <laughs> but, uh, Surprise! <laughs> the edition number engraved on the screen. There, you can see that. And, They're all different. Yeah, so this yeah. is all different. Each one is unique, right? Yeah. So we've got... These are just three serialized production models, and you can see every single one of them is different. And I believe it's sort of like uh, snakeskin scales. So when you move, if you rub your finger, it actually changes the yeah. coloration on there yeah. as well. Super cool. Uh, black Lycodont logo and a special strap with seal lyrics written on it. And it also came with a scarf. I believe this is the first Lyca to include a scarf. There it is. And shall go down in history is probably the only Lyca to include a <laughs> scarf. In fact, <laughs> this may be the only Leica to include an article of clothing, excluding bags. I can't think of another special edition that came with any kind of... If anybody knows of a, of a special edition Leica that came with clothing, please let me know in the chat because I don't think so. It's been done. Anyway, yes. so that came out in September. We sold out super quick. With only 500, that was not a huge surprise. Mm-hmm. Um, but I like it. Classy. It's not over the top. And I like the fact that each one was different. Yeah, for sure. And then we saw, just announced, David, what was the next Q2 special edition? I'm just going to click on news. It's right here at the front. Why don't you tell us about that? So here we are. This is the new Leica Q2 Ghost by Hodinkee. Um, And if you have lovely photos here. There we go. 
So we don't have one yet. That's no, why we, we don't. Can. We don't have one. But <laughs> That's you can, why we can't show it. But you can kind of get the aesthetic here, which is this um, all grayed out camera with gray leather wrapping. We've got silver dial, silver lens, white engraving, and there is the feet scale and the focal length and the A are all in, are in black, but everything else is in white. And you can see that's on the top. Basically, where back. there would be red lettering is now black. Yeah. Um, and exactly. then where there is white lettering is still white. Yeah, matching gray buttons uh, or silver controls with, with white engravings. So I like that even the diopter is silver. Even, it's pretty cool. Even the diopter <laughs> is silver. So it's a pretty sweet looking camera. And this is the... it does, yeah, and it comes with the a matching uh, woven mm. gray strap as well. Yes. And this what... is the second collaboration with Hodinkee. It is. Um, after the M10P Ghost from about three years ago. Yeah, I'm going to show that. Yeah. So, so this, this one is, yeah, here you go. You can talk about that. Oh, uh, yeah. This was, if you're into watches, uh, you're familiar with Hodinkee. If not, they are like a watch blog sales. I don't know. They do a lot of watch stuff. And there's a lot of connection between Leica and the world of horology. So this was their first collaboration, the M10P Ghost, which came with the 35 Sumalux. Super, super cool. Although this is interesting. What? They didn't black out the surround here. So on the Q2 Ghost... They well, they've, they've come a long way since out. then. Yeah, yeah. So they, um, yeah, they collaborated again with Hariki to make the Q2 Ghost. That was just announced on... Uh, when was it announced? Like uh, last November, week? November 15th. Yeah, last week. <laughs> pretty, it's pretty new. So we haven't seen this yet. This is limited to 2,000 for the world. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we'll get one of them in soon. So that was the other special edition Q2. And there was a third special edition release, uh, which came out... Uh, at the Celebration of Photography event in Germany on October 20th, which is the also the third camera in the Reporter series. Well, let's kick over to that. So the uh, that would be the SL2S Reporter. So first we had the M10P Reporter. Then we had the Q2 and Q2 Monochrome Reporter cameras. Uh, then we have now the SL2S Reporter. And what makes the Reporter cameras unique is really two things. One is the unique green paint. And two is the aramid fiber body covering, which takes the place of the leather or whatever that normally is on there. I'm going to use gloves because I'm borrowing this camera from someone. And, yeah. Uh, and I don't want to... you can come back to us. I for... want to get my Whoop. mitts all over it. Well, now you can watch Josh. There we go. <laughs> Let, let's just do this. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, if you're watching, this... this is your favorite part of hanging out with me. Oh, gosh. Watching me put on my gloves. Uh, all right, here we go. Back to refresh. This is the first and one. And the first SL camera with no red dot. That's correct. That's correct. This is the first one with no red dot. This is the first special edition of any SL camera. Mm -hmm. Limited to a thousand. And they just started shipping. We want to get the close up. A little uh, lens cap, actually. Oh, I have a lens cap in there. There, there you go. go. Better. Perfect. Oh, am I focus here? Yes. All right. So there you can see it is actually interesting that it's painted instead of anodized, which is what the uh, traditional SL2S is in the black. And it has the sort of textured. Aramid covering. I'll show you the bottom. Bottom is covered for the battery is still black, but that's okay because most of the bottom of the camera is black, which makes sense because you're going to be putting this down on stuff and you don't want the paint to get all scratched up. Uh, you can see the side. Side there. It's hard to focus on that. But yeah, so this is, I'll show you the front, of course, the most important part. SL2S reporter. Beautiful. I think if you have a Q2 reporter and an M10P reporter, this makes a nice set. Um, and again, I'm surprised that this is the we talked about this today. This is the first mm -hmm. special edition SL camera. Yeah, it's hard to believe. Yeah, hopefully not the last because I happen to like you know things like this that are not ostentatious or absurd. Just look really cool and they differentiate. It does from the standard SL two S and SL two that we know uh, pretty well. So nice. Yeah, super cool. I'm glad I could show that today. All right, back okay. In, back in your hermetically sealed. Uh, <laughs> there we bag. go. There we go. Okay. Okay. Nice and nice and safe. You're you're actually reminding me of of some of my my travels to Japan because the cab drivers, the taxi drivers, actually all wear white gloves like that. Which uh -huh. is kind of these are these are very handy. You can now drive a taxi in Japan. Perfect. I am qualified. Yeah. Um, any questions, David, that we see about the stuff we just announced? Let's take a look. Before we uh, Ooh, okay. move on, we have a lot of stuff in the chat. Well, I'll let him poke around with that. We have so, a lot of I'm stuff. Kind of, I'll let David look, um, but I'll keep blabbing a little bit. So. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got basically three special editions that have come out in the last three months, uh, which we'd like to see. What's cool is, too, at least in the U.S., I couldn't speak for the rest of the world, the price points come in pretty close to what the standard versions come in, which is always nice. And, um, you know, it means you can use it. I mean, you don't have to worry about some super valuable shelf piece getting ruined that's 
impossible to replace or whatever. Um, just yeah. nice. People come. Oh, cool. Hopefully, we'll have a ghost camera to show at some point, um, just because those are really cool. They do. And, they do uh, look yeah. really cool. So that was the three special editions. Um, let's talk. I feel quickly. like we really blew through that very efficiently. Well, yeah, because they're pretty straightforward. Right. I so, think. so as you may or not be aware, these are the same technical specifications as the stock editions, just limited and unique in terms of their Correct. appearance. Correct. Yeah. yeah. You're going to get different cosmetics, mm -hmm. different straps sometimes, different look, but functionally, functionally the same. They're gonna Which be is good same. because right. these are highly functional cameras. Yes, yes, yes. That just look a little cooler, right? Correct. You don't yeah. want it to uh, to work any differently unless it, it actually is quite rare for Leica to do a special edition that has functional differences. Mm -hmm. It does happen. Well, the the ASC, the ASC is one. My, when I think of that, the first thing that come, always comes to mind is the M9 Titanium. Sure. Oh, because of the because it had LED, LED illuminated frame yeah. lines, it had finger look capability, mm -hmm. and it really um, changed. Or really set the direction for a lot of what Leica was going to do later. It did yeah, that was a right. That was because uh, that came out in the M9 generation. Yeah. But it really set the tone for what came in the 240 generation yeah. in terms of the electronic projected frame lines. Exactly. And some of the other niceties. So yeah, sometimes they they do innovative special products. Uh, the M Edition 60 set the tone for a few generations of cameras that came out without uh, rear SLEDs. Like this is the, interesting. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to address. The last comment there, because every time we show, often when we show special editions, we get these comments, which yeah. I understand, because obviously I get where they're coming from, which is basically sort of trying to understand wh why is Leica, like, why would Leica do special editions? What's the point? Is it just ostentatious? Wh why? And number one, Leica has a very long history of special editions, collaborations with other artists, manufacturers, designers. They've made, you can go back and look at the gold M42s and Platinum M6s, and the funny thing is, the first reason I give for like doing this is because it's fun. People tend to forget that photography is supposed to be fun. It's fun. Isn't so, it? Yes, really? it's supposed to be fun. Oh. So for me, when I see that Leica says, okay, we're gonna make all these lenses, all these cameras, I mean, how many systems do they have now? How many lenses do they have now? Cutting edge products that they mm -hmm. really are genuinely relevant. Yeah. So. I have no issue with them saying, we've done all this. Let's do something fun. Let's do something where it shows we're not maybe taking ourselves too seriously. But it's nothing. We've talked about this before. This is not something new. Like is not just pulling whatever, a cash grab out of the hat or right. something. Like, right. you know, they've been doing this for 30, 40 years. Yeah. There's been a long history of like a special editions going back. I mean, the M6 alone had how many special editions? I don't even know. I mean, tons of them. Yeah. Tons. I mean, they made Safari Green R cameras and lenses. Mm -hmm. So that's right. Leica has a even long and storied history of special editions, unique editions, mm -hmm. things that are really wild and limited, things that are a little more mainstream. Yeah. And what it does is number one, again, it excites you. It's fun. It's something different. If you don't like it, don't buy it. It's just like <laughs> anything else. You know, you might not like my giant inventory of plaid shirts, but I do. So you wouldn't buy any plaid shirts. I'm not offended that the shirt company makes plaid shirts and solid shirts. I'm like, I'm just going to buy the plaid shirts. And <laughs> I think that's something important, too, is that it's not like making a special edition is taking away. Right. In fact, it's adding. Because like, a, like we just said with the M9 Titanium, mm -hmm. we'll often test new finishes or new designs or new concepts on special editions in small numbers to see how it may play into things they're going to make later. I feel that's also been done with uh, lens shade designs. Mm, very true. There was a yes. redesign of the screw on metal shades that was introduced on special editions before it was introduced on yes. silver production. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Leica is a company that is not just going to sit there and make boring boxes all day long. They, they're they going to do some of that, mm -hmm. although not too many boring boxes, but they're going to have some fun. And again, if you don't like a special edition that Leica makes, then don't buy it. It won't hurt my <laughs> feelings, I promise, because, because there's someone out there who will love it. They have done some absolutely wild stuff. I mean, the red anodized 262 and 50 Outbow, which, Crazy. by the way, the 50 Apo is one of the... Proven to be a great investment. Wow. Yeah. Um, car companies do it. Watch companies do it. Clothing companies do it. There is not a... It's not unusual for manufacturers of high-end or niche or... Um, yeah, what's, what's the high-end? I'm trying to get the word I'm coming to Boutique? Doesn't matter. Boutique. There you go. To, in addition to their product portfolio, come out with special editions. And, and you can also see they've been doing more collaborations. So it's not... You know, it sort of is, you know, building a bigger tent because doing... Did we actually cover the BAPE? Was that also new? 
That, that might have been that a was new. a while. That was a couple months ago. Okay, so yeah. so the, they did a Deluxe Seven Bape or Bathing Ape Edition, which is a, a Japanese streetwear brand, which is kind of completely in another direction, but building on what they did, a, a successful collaboration they did last year, which was the the Deluxe uh, Ray Barbie Vans Edition, mm -hmm. right? And they said, oh wow, this actually got kind of popular in the, the street culture skater yeah. world. Let's try another brand. Um, or that, or maybe Bape came to like and said, "Hey, we saw what you did with Vans. We'd love to do that too." So it it kind of opens the brand up to a new audience yeah. who wouldn't be the typical thing. And what's What's fascinating and is then we see with Hodinky and Seal and is all these collaborations. David and I um, have a very interesting perspective that most of the people watching the show won't have. Is Sure, you may buy one special edition or two, but what we get to do is talk to lots and lots and lots of people that mm -hmm. buy special editions over a long time, and you'd be surprised how many people are actually using them. Yeah. I mean, seriously. Like, it's really not just them. something to sell to a collector and put on a shelf. Sure, there are totally people that do that, just like there's people that buy Porsche Carrera GTs and put 672 miles on them in 15 years or whatever. So you're going to have the gamut of individuals acquiring this stuff, people who are going to use the heck out of them, people who are just going to take it for a special occasion, and some people who are going to leave it on a shelf. And that's fine with me because I like seeing the range. It's kind of cool to see a special edition that's used. I have in my office right now an M9P Hermes, mm. super beautiful special nice. edition, that's all scratched up and used and half the stuff is missing, and I'm like, okay, mad respect. <laughs> that's technically what it was made for. So. I don't know. I have no issue with Leica doing this because, because they have a vast and comprehensive product portfolio of very effective, high-quality products. I mean, if you tell me that everything Leica makes is trash, mm -hmm. like, oh, there's nothing good anymore, and then they start doing special dishes, I'd be like, nah, okay, okay. You got a point, right. But it's not. Pick up an SL2S and tell me that camera doesn't blow your mind. Rant over. I'm just saying. That's a very useful segue to talk about some new serialized production products. Um, well, we should talk about the firmware first before we get into the good stuff, because that's another like small. That's point. an easy one. Yeah, that's an easy one. So funny I'll go, enough, I'll go over David that, pulled yeah. this up. The single most asked question in the last twenty-four <laughs> hours wasn't about the M6 or steel rim. It was what the heck is in this new firmware for the M10 series of cameras, and what it does is it actually makes the camera ten grams lighter with a no. Uh, <laughs> okay, if you actually say that, it's going to be all over the internet. And <laughs> no, it's uh, oh god. David, please, please tell don't. us and show us the article on my net forum. Okay, Jose, give me the screen. There we go. Uh, so this just happened last week. Leica issued firmware updates for the entire generation of M10 cameras. And we have here a handy dandy, can I zoom in on that? Just magnify and enhance, just so you guys can see. Uh, we have a handy dandy chart here, so you can see uh, what camera you might have and the corresponding firmware version. All you have to do is click on it, and we host this on our web server so that if Leica changes the links on you, you can still always get these because we will house these forever. Um, well, I mean, Maybe not forever. For as long as it needs to be. I mean, yeah. after the meteor strikes, <laughs> maybe not. But for now, for the foreseeable future, we've got them hosted here. Download them. And then I also have some handy dandy instructions, depending if you have a regular M10 uh, or you have an M10D. Yeah. So follow along, easy, easy. And to answer the question, the only thing that this changed was it added support for one of the new products that we're about to talk about, which is the 35. Sumalux 1.4, no aspheric, no nothing. The repre uh, addition to the Classics line, the version one steel rim, uh, which we are going to talk about momentarily. Mm -hmm. But basically because that lens now has six bit coding and the original did not, they had to add support for six bit coding and the corresponding uh, lens corrections into the entire M10 generation of cameras. There it is. Yeah, and they snuck it into the last M11 firmware. They did. They so the M11 firmware anymore. came out right before the introduction of the of the steel rim, so it, it was rolled up in there kind of Very on the on the quiet. When are we gonna get the firmware for the M6 that supports that? So so the <laughs> M6 does not need firmware support <laughs> for it. It's a special roll of film you put in there yeah, and like, no, you know, no, okay, fine. That. All right, so that's that. Go back to us, Jose. There we go. And just so in case you don't know the site that we keep going to, you'll see the title here, Red Dot Forum. If you go to reddotforum.com, you can see all of these news articles that we have posted. Always check that out. Stay tuned uh, for news updates that we post on a regular basis. Certainly many more on there than we do shows. 
um, because those are posted as the news happens, the shows we do as we have the time to do it. So <laughs> yes, we're sorry again for the long break, but um, we couldn't do it in other countries. That's right. I also, like, I also was in a cast for what f- five weeks. I broke my left hand. Yeah. Um, that would have been, you know that would have been a funny show. I couldn't pick up anything, but now the cast is off, so I can wear a watch again. <laughs> I can, the, the gloves are off. I can the photograph off. again. It feels yeah, good. It's fantastic. Um, all right, so that is that's sort of like the easy stuff to talk about. That's why we could shoot through it all. Um, before we got dive into the steel room, any questions that we need to address? Uh, so the firmware, people asking about that. Um, the VisaFlex 2 compatibility was the last update. That was the last update. This would include it, of course, if you skip one. Um, if you watch any of our firmware episodes, of which we have two, you'll know how to do it if you have questions about that because we covered M10, M11, um, SL2, Q2, in that. Okay. Got? Any questions? Um, just some comments on special editions, and somebody wants a Q2 BMW M edition. They did. So, Leica did collaborate with BMW on when? the X1. Did they really? Because there was a BMW X1, and there was a Leica ooh, X1. So they ooh, did that. Okay. That was not in the US. They uh-huh. also did a collaboration on the X2 with the Jaguar Owners Club in Germany. I remember that. It didn't have a special like place in the trunk or something? Was, uh, or no, was that, that was something else. Was that Bentley? There was some collaboration where they had a special what case in the trunk. Okay, okay, if you say so. But anyway, so they've done some automotive collaborations. I would love for them to do more, but I think they're just difficult brands to work with. Uh, yeah. They did have Walter De Silva, who was Audi's designer for a while, designing stuff for them, which is cool. Um, and they've done stuff with Zagato. It's kind of car related. Well, they used, yeah, they used Zagato. Audi. Audi design was involved in the development of the, the T701, the TL2. Um, some other camera, too, was Audi design. Well, they had my titanium. And, and titanium. Yeah, and with the PL. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. So, um, yeah, they've definitely worked with these different automotive brands, but they don't have an M edition. That would be an issue. BMW M edition Q? That would be very confusing. Yeah, that would it's be. Like MQ. <laughs> the QM BM Q. I don't know. That's too yeah, many letters. Yeah, yeah. But who knows? All I right. love it. I mean, I if you've ever dealt with me, you know I'm a freak for special editions. I love that stuff. I love chasing down obscure ones. And cars. And special cars. And special cars and anything special edition I just find super, super interesting. So, yeah. All right. Love it or hate it. What's next? Oh, this bad boy. So. What do we got there? If you're familiar with Leica's classic line, that is a essentially them reissuing vintage era lenses with modernized barrels and updated lens coatings while keeping the original optical formula mm-hmm. the same. Essentially the same. Well, let, let's give a quick rundown of That's the previous ones. my plan. So, what was the first one? The first one was the Sumeron. 28, 28 Sumeron. Yep. yep. And the second one? Fanbar. And the third one? 50 Noctilux 1.2. And now we have the fourth one, which is the 35 Sumalux. That's really all it's called. But, yeah, uh, that's it. Right. <laughs> it is not a period. What this is, is a reissue of the very, very, very first version of the 35 Sumalux, which was made in 1961 for just a handful of years. Mm -hmm. And they called it the steel rim because the front edge of the lens where the uh, lens it attaches was made from stainless steel. Mm -hmm. So it has a steel rim. Pretty straightforward. And and the reason, because the version 2 that was put in production from 64, 65, all the way until... 95. 95. Mm -hmm. This is one of the longest running M lenses. And it's the same exact optical formula. But why is that not a steel rim and this one is? Well, it's just, what do you mean? That doesn't have a steel no. rim on it. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> like, right. So because they redesigned the yes. lens shape. So, right. The lens never changed optically, mm-hmm. allegedly. Now, allegedly. I've done a lot of deep diving into this, and there are some reports that maybe the coatings changed over time, which makes sense. If you're making a lens for 30 plus years, it's not going to be exactly the same as technology of of lens design and coating and construction improves. So, yeah, there may be slight differences, but the optical formula Mm -hmm. has never changed. You just, really, the changeover is when you went from the steel rim with the Olux hood to the not steel rim with the 12504 hood, which happened in the late 60s or mid to late 60s. So, every lens since then, until it was discontinued, um, was now we now the call them 35 Sumalux Preospheric. That's mm-hmm. sort of the General overarching term, yeah. name. And then in that subset, you'd find the steel rim, which represents those first couple of years of production. They're extremely rare and extremely valuable. They're pretty much all five figure lenses at this point mm-hmm. 20, 30, $40,000 more if they're black paint or if they have boxes and all this stuff. So, in an effort to sort of 
capture a bit of that uh, legendary legendariness. Mm -hmm. Like I brought their fourth lens into the classic line, which was the steel rim. Yeah. So you want to show that off? Well, you want to tell us about it since you were there when it came out? Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. All right, Jose, set me up. Oh, hey, look at that. Nice. All right, this has a little little cap on it. it comes with a little push-on cap. Do you have the different shades for me? I do. You want to show those? I do. First? I do. So this is, let me just show, show off. Show the lens first. Yeah. yeah, show off the lens. So because it is so compact in its dimensions, it only weighs 200 grams, and it is very, very small. It's, it's hard to believe this is actually a 35. Take the back half off so they can really see the size. Yeah, yeah. There you that go. this is a 35 1.4. I mean, it is, oh, I've got a little camera here. There you go. Um, it is really, really small um, and, and nice and light, even though it is, uh, I believe this one is, is this is brass construction. It is brass, yep. yes. Yeah, so perfect. this is this is brass construction with silver chrome, and yet it still feels pretty light, uh, especially versus a, a current generation 35 1.4, a spheric, which we are going to talk about soon. Uh, same optical design as the original. If you actually look at the side-by-side -side optical path drawing versus the original, it, it does vary extremely slightly because those glass elements aren't available anymore. They're not made anymore. So what Leica did is basically reverse engineered that optical formula so that they could produce the same look with modern glass and modern coatings. And we do have the iconic steel rim here, which is... That's what it's describing, the steel rim. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, unlike the original, it does take a standard 46 millimeter filter. Yeah. That's a big point I want to, that we want to harp on is this does have a standard E46 filter thread. What David's threading on there is a current production like an E46 UVA filter. So that makes life a lot easier. However, you can keep the close up. It's okay, because I'm going to yep. hand David a hood. To, sure, uh, sure. Jose. Um, however, nope, it, other one. Other one. <laughs> there you go. Hey, hey. However, what doesn't work is the lens hood situation with the filter. So this hood that David's about to show you is styled after the original Olux hood from the steel rim in kind of where the steel rim got its function from. But it does not work with the filter attached to the lens. So what Leica does is they give you two different lens hoods in the box so they don't have to buy a separate one. And the second hood is this one is a 46 millimeter threaded shade. So you would simply either thread it into the lens, or if you had a filter on, you would thread it into the filter. That way you can use the lens with filters and the hood at the same time. Like so. Um, what they don't give you is a lens cap to use with that. So what we've discovered is the 46 millimeter breakthrough cap, the little pinch cap, fits kind of like inside pretty nicely. There you go. And that works quite well. So that's our workaround for the lack of cappage. Not um, bad, actually. Because that's annoying to have to keep taking the hood on and off. And the cap they give you for the lens itself is pretty flimsy. And yeah, I don't want to have to go buy in replacements. So, right. so, so, that, so that works out pretty well. Yeah. And uh, I'm just going to undo this real quick. And if we take the... Now, you don't need to use a filter, a UV filter, the same as you would on an original one because this is modern coatings, which means you can actually clean it without getting rub marks on it. So this is a much more durable coating than the an original original version one, but you can use the screw on metal shade, just you right on. You showed that already. Show, yeah. show the other one like that, or you can also screw. Whoop! Actually, attach this one, like. It's terrible. There you go. <laughs> it's such a. There you go. No, like it looks cool, but it's not. Yeah, it's a little. It's uh, not great. That, well, it's a little unwieldy. Again. But, yeah. In 1961, when this lens came out, they didn't know how to make lens hoods nearly right. as well as they and, know and, how to make now. And this right here, that wobble and that sound, I don't know if you can hear the clinking, but it definitely moves a bit because it's being retained by the app, the clips slash the little grips on the aperture ring. So it's a little, uh, yeah, it's a little, it's a little something. Anyway. Yeah, uh, the cap is a breakthrough 46 millimeter cap. They're like $7. We sell them. Jose can put a link in the chat. And it does work if you don't have the... Yeah, that's what's cool about it. It yeah. fits in the hood or it fits on the lens and it's cheap and, you know, it's not the most beautiful thing ever, but it functions perfectly fine. So right. <laughs> it's good enough for us. So we either recommend using it like this or like this. If you are inclined to use the original recreation Olux shade, more power to you. Ours pretty much just stays in the box. Yeah. 
because Looks this cool, this is just a lot more practical in terms now, of. Now I should say uh, you can come back to us, Jose. Yep. That our next show, which is going to be in December, is going to be the 35 Sumalux episode. So I realize there's going to be a million questions about how these various 35 Sumaluxes compare to a bunch of other 35 Sumaluxes. We're not going to deep dive into that today because it would take us two hours to do it, and we have to talk about other stuff. So I do want to show one little sure. kind of gotcha here. Yes. And this is not the only lens with this, but lenses of this era tend to have this little feature, which can drive you a little crazy if you don't know it's there. <laughs> yeah. I think you know what I'm about to talk yes, about, Yes, right? I do, yes. Okay, so if you come back to the close-up here, let's take a look. Uh, it's like, oh, well, I've got my lens here, I've got it mounted on camera, and uh, wait, uh, what? It's stuck. It's stuck. It's stuck. <laughs> Josh, Josh, Josh. Give me a new one. Give me a new lens. No. On here, on the focus tab, there is a little lock that you have to depress, and then you can magically turn the lens again. It's an infinity lock. If you go a little bit too far, the lens will then lock in place. Uh, so it's designed, you know, I guess uh, Leica wanted to stay really true to the original, and they kept the infinity lock there. But if you don't know it's there, uh, it can drive you a little mad. Yeah. All right. Again, it. this is still a vintage lens from the 1960s, just new. So Modern, it's not right. going to handle and behave like a brand new lens. That's what brand new lenses are for. This is going to have some quirks, just like the 1-2 Noctilux and the Sumeron and the Thambar all have their weird quirks as well. That's just part of the fun. Uh, yeah. David has some sample images you. on Red Dot Forum, which he's going to show you right now. Show us. So uh, when the lens was announced in Germany, I was there with with Kirsten, who we, we often talk about, and I got to try another product, which is called the M6, which we'll talk about next. Yep. But um, I, I wanted to turn around the samples quickly, so I took it off the M6, and I put it onto my SL2S that I had with me in Germany, and took a few samples here. So this is this is the 3514 steel rim, wide open, uh, with some nice backlighting. And these are just, I mean, this is right outside the Lights Cafe, in um, right at the factory, so, as you can see here. And I wanted to show what it looks like. Basically, the, the first picture was minimum focus showing rear bokeh. Um, this one is showing front bokeh. As you can see, I've got the reeds out of focus, the background in focus. Has a nice sort of painterly pastel look. Definitely not as crazy and out there and impressionistic as the Thambar or as the 51.2 Noctilux. Mm -hmm. It definitely is a more cohesive daily use lens than those are. And I think it's important to mention that point, David, too, because yeah. when the 1.2 Noctilux and the Thambar came out originally in their respective time periods, they were designed to be look lenses. They were designed to give you a very distinct, almost kind of wild look, even in period. Whereas when the 35 Sumalux first came out in the 60s, it was designed to be a high performance lens. Exactly. So that carries through to today. Certainly, the definition of high performance has changed, but it's not going to give you that wildness that some of these lenses that were made like that originally, it's actually going to give you a pretty usable performance, especially as you start stopping down. So for instance, he's came back to me. So th for instance, this is um, the lens at 5.6. And this is a tricky lighting situation because we've got the sun, end of day, bouncing off of glass right into the camera lens. And you can see that it's, it's like the current 35 Simulux, it's pretty flare resistant and pretty sharp. You know, it doesn't lose contrast elsewhere, even though we've got this big, big bright spot of the sun reflection and it's sharp into the corners. That's at 5.6. Here's another example at 5.6. This is actually- And, and in, you can see all these images in the Red Dot forums. So, you can, yeah. yeah. They're all there for you to check out. But you can see the fine detail resolution in these, in these tree branches and nice color rendition. It, it's a very high performing lens once you stop it down just a little bit and wide open, it has that really nice look. Here's another one, this is at f8 to just really stop down and get even flat field performance. It looks like a modern lens, yeah. which is kind of incredible given, you can come back to us, it's kind of uh, incredible that, that this is a lens from the early 1960s. Yeah, and, and that really means it was designed in the late 50s. Yeah. It takes some time to do that, so. And, and stop it down to f4, 5.6 to f8, and this is yeah. this is a high performing lens on modern like a digital cameras. Right, because that's not an SL2S, which is a BSI. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's only 24 megs, right. but still demanding sensors. So. A nice match for that lens, though. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and then wide open, you get that look. I know. I'm gonna go photograph uh, with this tomorrow. So <laughs> we, we, as Josh said, we are gonna take a look. Our next episode is dedicated to 35 millimeter Sumalux. 
both this one as well as all of the other ones. So we're going to do yeah. a really deep dive into yes. the 35 Lux. Yes. So that we're going to be able to answer very clearly then, you know, how do all the lenses exactly. compare and, and exactly how they render and perform. So we're not going to cover that today because that would just take ever. Like, we'd be here all night. So stay tuned. Plus, we got to give you guys a reason to tune back in again. So That's right. That's right. <laughs> so I think that covers the steel room. Any questions about mm. that? The yes, the Olux shade does fit the original, which is pretty cool. Uh, photographic results we just showed. Yes, the Sumeron is smaller than the Steel Rim. That's that's the smallest M lens right now is the 28 Sumeron. Okay. Pretty much well covered. So then, after the Steel Rim and the SO2S Reporter, what? No, someone says, nice meeting me in, in, oh. <laughs> in Lights Park. Yes, hi. <laughs> there was a third product <laughs> announcement um, this at the same time, well, which is... Yes. We're going in order. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. 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 Fine. Fine. Okay. Fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> which is inside of this magical box, which is now, Mike. I know you're watching, Mike Knobloch. He sent me a clip of me on a past episode, basically saying that they don't make the M6 anymore. They're never going to make the M6 again. So get over it. So I have to eat those words because <laughs> now you can buy a brand new M6. But of course. What really matters is that shows you that I clearly have no idea what Leica is going to do because I wouldn't have said that if I if I knew for sure that something like this was coming. Oh, you should not have made the bet to shave your head. I know, right? This is ridiculous. So, <laughs> the Leica M6 is possibly the most beloved mainstream analog M camera. Mm -hmm. It isn't the most produced. That would be the M3. Sure. But it's a camera that we still see in frequent use today. It's a camera that really started Leica's um, modern M film camera design, a 0.72 finder, light meter, mm -hmm. hot shoe, et cetera, et cetera, and a six frame line. So yep. now I would not have expected Leica to come out with another film camera. We have currently the MP and the MA, mm -hmm. and then of course limited editions, blah, blah, blah. But they surprise us. Yes. So a little bit of history. And if you want to learn more, we actually have an entire episode on the full anthology of analog M cameras, well, which, for this one, which now we have to redo <laughs> because of this. Oh, but but just a, a brief history on the M6 came out in 1984 and was produced until sources vary here, but around 2000 when it was sort of phased over in between the M6 TTL, which was only around for what, four years before the uh, the M7 came out. Mm -hmm. So the M6 TTL was definitely not as common, which is, I think, why Leica went for the straight original M6. And this is modeled after the original, original M6. Yes. Um, pre, I would say pre-1988. So, so this is actually modeled after the camera that Leica produced from 1984 to 1988, which was the lights version. Right. So when they first started making the M6, they were making cameras or their, their factory was in Wetzlar. Mm -hmm. And then four years later, they moved to Solms. Now, of course, they're back in Wetzlar now. And I think it's quite clever yes. that they, when they redid the M6, they made it similar to the Wetzlar made M6s, which have some very subtle not changes. An not an um, accident. To the, yeah. From the Solms M6. So let's dive into that. The first thing you'll see is it comes in a vintage box. This is not a vintage M6 box. This is the one you get with the new one. That is. Which is, by the way, that sick, is really cool. Which is sick. Yeah. So now let's let's take a look. I, they started that with the uh, the fifty one point two reintroduction. They did. They yeah. did. Uh, all right. Put the box here. Nice. First thing is we got a cool little sort of folder thingy, um, which has in it a also cool a period correct looking manual. So okay. sick. you can do it. Just do the full top view, and we'll yeah. take a look at those okay. little unboxing. There we go. So we got a period correct manual, nice. which is super super cool. Usual paperwork. This is the little like um, the manual is really cool box thing that the paperwork comes show in. The, show the box. Um, and there's the box. And then yeah, there's That's, the product sick. code. That's ugh, I love it. Um, of course, I don't think there was holograms on the '84 <laughs> version. You also get a slotted battery cover in addition to the standard battery cover, which is a nice touch. Something they also do on the MP, like that. And they give you a battery as well. So hooray! Um, then of course. What's really cool, let me just get this out of my way here, That's is neat. we have the iconic plastic M6 box, just like the original ones came in. Cool. Well, I think the original one was a white box, wasn't it? Uh, it was black. It was somewhat, yeah. okay. Let me just okay. move some things out of my way here. Oh, there she is in her plastic. So we've got the strap here, just like the originals came in. And let's oh, show, show the top of the case. Yeah, it's cool. Sweet. 
It's this red velour. And it's the old look. It's the old text as well. <laughs> All right. Let's take a look at this bad boy. All right. Here is... Let me get some things out of our way again. All right. The new, but not new, Leica M6. We can see a couple of things here. Number one, we have the Lights logo, not the Leica logo, which, again, harkens back to the original M6. Well, I think we actually have a slide for this here. Um, we probably slide. do. Yeah. Slide. Yay, there we go. Is it an electric slide? Okay. Um, it has the same matte black painted finish as the M11 and the same body covering as the M11. Um, a big difference here in terms of construction is the M6 is now brass, top and bottom, unlike the original M6s, which were zinc. The very, very last iteration of the M6 TTL, the Let's In Editions, I'm sure I butchered that, <laughs> were brass, but um, that was about it, uh, as well as some TTL um, black paint editions. So all brass construction, just like, ironically, the black M11 is aluminum. So we actually now know how the M11 would look like if it was brass, because it is the same construction, uh, or it's, it's now the same paint as the M11, the same material, uh, as the M10R and the M11 in silver. So, if you look at the back, it's an updated, um, slightly updated ISO dial. Still looks super cool. Look at the top, we've got the Ernst Lights Wetzlar Germany engraving. Otherwise, looks like an M6, the two stage advanced lever. And there's our base blade. Of course, they didn't have these stickers back then. Otherwise, you know, pretty much the same. Now, if we want, we can compare this, if I get my hands on it, to, where's my, here it is, sorry. Here is an, can we get uh, without the text, Jose? There we, or just, can you give me the whole thing? Do I have to, yeah, there we go, that's what I want. Uh, this is still not big enough. All right, we have here on the bottom an original, eh, <laughs> sorry, an original like, like a Vetzlar M6. So you can see we've got the lights logo, the same thing. Even the switch, I mean, even the, the lens release red dot, which of course is quite faded on the original one, is the same. If we took out the top plates, we have the same engraving. I'm gonna pick it up. Here we go. Hold on. Like this. Ta da! We've got the same Ernst Lights uh, Vetzlar engraving, except now it's it, the old one said GMBH and the new one doesn't. But you can really tell that this is an M6. I mean, they look 99% the same. Uh, we, we Definitely the patina is missing. Well, yeah, we can show the backs as well. Uh, top one, obviously the older one. We're missing the flash sync for it and the. You know, and the cover. It's, it's you been can well used. Yeah, you can tell. And of course, they used. do not have the um, bumpers now. The Solms M6, which I will grab right now. So the M6 that was made in Solms later on is going to be 99% the same, except it has a Leica dot on it. This is obviously a much nicer condition camera as well. And it has the uh, bumpers sort of protect the side of the camera. And it does not have the engraving on the top like the Lights M6 does. Otherwise, functionally the same. Um, you can come back to me, Jose, or come back to us. Uh, there we go. So I think one of the questions that we've been getting a lot is... I'm just going to keep going, sorry. Yeah, no, I'm on go a... for it. Hey, you're on a roll, man. <laughs> I'm on a roll here. Just go. Is, well, right now you can buy two different metered film M cameras. I'm excluding the MA because it has no meter, so it's really in a different category. You have the MP and you have the M6. So the question would be, why would I buy an MP over an M6 or vice versa? Josh, why would I buy an MP over an M6 or vice versa? Thank you. Now, of course, we are factoring out <laughs> the one big issue here, which is availability. Mm. M6 being a brand new Leica product, being a product that's hard to make, um, it's just going to be hard to get for a while. But I'm going to forget about that fact for a minute and talk about the sort of hands-on stuff. Well, that's a, I would say that is a transitory, temporary situation. Eventually, Correct. they will be available. Yeah, I mean, we'll get to like 2030, 2035. We'll finally have some stock. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't have MPs in stock either. So right. you MPs know. have been yeah. kind of slow, anyway, slow trickle as well. So a couple of things. Number one is the finish. The MP is going to come in black paint or silver chrome. So if you love the black paint or if you love silver chrome, Get an MP because the M6 is only, at least currently, in the matte black painted finish of the M11. So you can't get a black shiny back plain M6, can't get a silver chrome M6. Of course, unless you go vintage, but we're talking about the 2022 version. Uh, that's the first thing. Second thing is, if you want the lack of a red dot, like if you were getting an M10P or an MP240, MP is going to have no red dot, just like, well, 
the MP, MP. 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 Yeah, that's gonna say like that's where the P comes from. Um, so that, again, so you know the the Leica script engraving on the top, you know, different cosmetics in terms of the the engravings, different um, with the, the leather material. This is like they call the shark skin. Yeah, so dials different on the back. Um, we, actually, we can do a close up, Jose. Mm-hmm. The full, yeah, the full view. There we go. So I have an MP black paint on the top. Sorry, I can't get them both perfectly. There you go. That's fine. And the M6, uh, new M6 at the bottom. You can see the ISO MP. dials are different. MP is on top. Okay, ISO dials are bottom. different. Obviously, the black paint is different. I'll show you the top plates here. <laughs> the engravings are different. I mean, you can see the reflectivity of that the classic like a black paint is, is dramatically different. The silver shutter speed, um, or, or shutter buttons around. The rewind. I'm getting there. Yeah, okay. Um, serial number engraving is different. And the two, two big functional differences between a new MP and a new M6 are also visible in this uh, shot here. Number one is the rewind. The M6 has the classic angled rewind knob. I'll flip that out for you while you hold it. Thank you. Here we go, like that. Let me just kind of take that out of the way so you guys can see it. And the MP has the classic MP rewind knob, which you pull up. Let's see if David can do that. There we go, like that. So that's one big functional difference. And the other is the frame advanced lever. The MP has the classic single piece metal frame advanced lever. And the M6 has the classic two piece plastic and metal frame advanced lever. As now, you can see it hinges. I would guess you could swap this out with the component from a, an M7 or a black chrome. Um, MP. I haven't tried that yet. Obviously, these cameras are extremely hard to get, so I'm not going to start taking one apart. So in theory, eventually that difference could be negated. Um, so then you're really talking about the rewind knob as the only real meaningfully functional difference, aside from a slightly different ISO dial, I suppose. Um, otherwise, they're both going to have the same viewfinder. They're going to have the same light meter. They're going to take the same film to the same lenses, the same batteries, the same straps, etc. Uh, this is a good question. Tell me. We need to cover this because it is an improvement. Mm. Um, someone says there's no offsetting on the new M6. Well, yes and no. There is an offsetting. It yes. just isn't labeled like it is on the MP. Correct. So it, the, on the MP, it says bulb slash off, mm-hmm. but the bulb position on the M6 is actually off. off as well. That is a change that is probably not discussed enough. It's not discussed enough. On the original M6, there is no off. And if you left it on and the the uh, shutter got half pressed down, your yeah. battery would die. That's exactly. kind of a, a known exactly. common thing that happens. Yeah. This one, as long as you switch it to the bulb position, it is it turns off the meter. Yeah. So really, availability aside, it comes down to the minor functional differences and your cosmetic interests, right? If you really love black paint or silver chrome, you're going to get an MP. If you love the lights logo, the red lights logo, or you love the matte black paint finish, you'll get an M6. But you're not going to be suffering with either one. They're both going to produce the same pictures. It's not like there's a sensor difference here. <laughs> well, if you use different film, you know. That's true. Yeah. Different film, fine. Um, the MA, which I haven't talked about that much, the reason is uh, just because the MA is effectively an MP without a light meter. Mm-hmm. The big difference here with the MA is it comes in black chrome or silver chrome, not black paint. The MA's other big difference is it has a metal... Um, ISO dial on the back, which is a nice touch. Mm-hmm. What I want to know is, I wonder if I could swap the film door from an MA onto a new M6. The finish would match. Mm. I'm going off on a tangent here. So, to choose an MA is really a commitment to having no meter. Mm-hmm. Whereas choosing an MP over an M6 is about all the stuff I just talked about. And if you want to learn more, check out our Analog M episodes. Yes. Because we go into all that minutia and detail. Correct. Because we got a lot of questions about how does an M2 compare to an M6, or yeah. an M, which is fine, which is why we have a two-hour plus episode about mm-hmm. the entire anthology of, of film cameras. So, That's right. That's right. Uh, it's a long rant. I need to stop talking. And is there any questions we need to answer about the M6? Um, what's the buffer limit on the M6? Uh, 36 frames. 36 frames, frames yeah. yeah. 37, depending on how you want the film. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I guess here's a question I have. Yes which I have not explored, could we use a like of it on an M6? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have one on my desk. I should have brought it. I didn't. Did you try it out? I haven't tried it yet. No, okay. but it's on my list. Okay. So, uh, yeah, the motor M, the one for Pro 8 motor M, the like of it, all those are going to work on the M6 because it is functionally an MP in terms of the things that matter, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is good because the MP is regarded as, in my humble, unbiased opinion, the best film camera you know, currently available in the world. I might have missed it, but did you talk about the viewfinder? Well, I said it was the same. 
as NMP. Right, so this is a, a much nicer finder than original M6. Correct. Original M6 can be upgraded to an MP finder at great expense in six months of time in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, but this way you get it without having to do that. So Yeah, so better optics. Also, the display is better where there, there's a functional difference in the light meter. Instead of an original M6 light meter just has an arrow and an arrow. And you just have to turn, you know, your, your mm -hmm. aperture, your shutter speed until like the arrows stop being one direction or another. On the, the new M6, it has an arrow, an arrow, and a center dot. So when you're on the money, you've got a dot. When you're half a stop off, it's a dot and an arrow. And when you're more than half a stop off, it's just an arrow. So it's a it's a much easier camera to meter with and, and kind of see your exposure. I did have the opportunity, as Josh mentioned, to actually use the M6 when I was in Germany. And it was a lot of fun. It was like modern classic. It, it was... Yeah. I know. It brought a smile to my face. Yeah, uh, just walking around Wetzlar and, and shooting with the M6. So I, I have strong I feelings about analog M's. Um, I spend many, many hours a week playing with them, and I have a large collection of them floating around my office. And one of the questions I got early on from one of my colleagues, I forget who, is, "Oh, Josh, do you think the new M6 is going to going to hurt the market for original M6s? Mm -hmm. You know, why would anybody buy an original M6 over the new one or whatever?" The reality is a couple things. Number one. It's not like Leica is flooding the market with new M6s. Number two, in the US, they're $5,300, give or take, whereas even the best example of a standard edition M6 is going to be less than that, maybe slightly less. We're talking about like collector grade top end of everything. And there's still a charm to the original M6, especially the Psalms M6s, which are going to be cosmetically different. It's going to have a slightly different meter, different finder. Mm -hmm. It's going to feel different because the mechanics are specific to the M6, the zinc components, on the top and bottom plate, mm -hmm. different gearing. It's a different camera than the current M6. The current M6 has more in common with an MP functionally and an M6 cosmetically, again, aside from those couple of key differences I mentioned, sure. than it does with the original M6. So it's a really interesting blend of vintage and modern, which I like because to me, it allows you to clearly decide whether you want an original M6 mm -hmm. because you want that experience. You want that vintage camera experience yep. or you want to go and buy a brand new camera. You don't have to worry about it. It's got the brand new finder, warranty, but it's going to be more expensive. Yeah. 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 Can Hopefully you get the that... new brass top plate put on an old M6? No. No. No, there's too many different um, things inside. If you ever open up one of these things, take the top plate off, it's like there's very little room. Um, so I think the, the reality is the M6s, they're not making any new old ones. They're making new new ones, but they're not making any new old ones. So that supply is, is going to stay the same. And over time, cameras will get lost, cameras will get stolen, that cameras will break, the old ones, I mean. And so they're always still going to be special. And I'm always still going to get excited when I get the chance to, to buy one, um, send it to Germany and get the whole thing CLA. So yeah, it's a good time to be a Leica nerd, that's for sure. Doesn't hurt. And how many companies are like, wow, people really love this camera. We should bring it out again. Seriously, that's so sick. <laughs> I mean, I love that Leica, again, they clearly are not forgetting where they came from. Yeah. And they're clearly not ignoring the fact that analog is on the way up. Mm -hmm. We just had an event in the store celebrating analog mm -hmm. photography with 30, 40 people, all that shot, roll of film, and, and got a process, and the swapping prints, and just excited about the love of film. And by the way, someone there had a sweet, just cherry M6. Yeah, Ralph's camera, oh yeah. Oh my gosh. No, or so the M3, pretty. you mean? Oh, well, that was an M3. Yeah. There was also an M6. Oh, the um, M6 TTL. Yeah, the, the silver one, yeah. We saw some Oof. really, really nice film cameras. Yeah, there. actually, so the M6 TTL, silver, had a new silver 3514 aspheric FLE on it with, you know, and it's just like, wow, that looks great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it didn't look dissimilar to this combination, but it's an M6, an original M6. Like, it's cool. Yeah. So it's a good time to be into, into Leica right now because we have this fantastic vintage portfolio, the fantastic current portfolio, special editions, regular stuff, old stuff, new stuff. But of course, there's still one key product we haven't talked about yet, which I'm going to take it over to David. There's uh, another product. And they also have to be sitting right in front of you. So, oh my gosh, it's right here. It's the one that came out the earliest, but the one we saved for last. Because it wasn't at the event, it was just sort of rolled into all this. So if you watched the show before, and we've had this talk about lenses before, and people are like, when it comes to M lenses, what's your desert island lens? And Josh and I typically give the same answer, which is the 35 1.4 mm -hmm. FLE. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I guess that's going to change now because <laughs> because now it's the 35 1.4 FLE version 2. 
And we've got it here in, in black and in silver. So I am going to talk, which one's easier to show on camera, you think? The uh, black one. The black one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pack up the uh, my M6 mess while he talks about that. Don't mind me. Cleaning up my mess here. So yes, this is, just to get the naming out of yep. the way, why? First, we had the 35 Sumo Lux Empirical. Yes. Then we had the ASPH. Mm -hmm. Then we had the FLE. And now we have the FLE2. We'll but we're going to go that. over all this. Yeah, we'll dive into that more just in our next show. But we're going to call this one, we're calling it the FLE2 because it is the second version of the 35 Sumo Lux FLE. Yes. What does FLE stand for? Floating Lens Element. Okay. So okay. Go. Show it to so, us. Here it is. Here's the original one if you want to compare it. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I got oh, all the toys so for thoughtful. you. I got all the toys for you. Get you anything. I know. That's okay. All right. <laughs> so let, let's uh, get a close up here, Jose. First, let me just go over this one and then I'll compare to yes. the previous one yes. and, as, as we go. All right. So this is the lens. Do you also have. Oh, I'm going to use this to compare as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm, I'm gathering all my goodies That's over here. That's fine. You're good. All right. So here it is. Uh, it does look a little different in terms of proportions. Just to kind of break that down, it's it's two millimeters wider here uh, in diameter. It's 12 millimeters shorter when comparing lens shade to lens shade because this one, as you see, it doesn't look like it has a lens shade. But wait, there is more. <laughs> as you can see, the lens shade extends and it actually will not push back in casually because it's that newer twist style that we saw. And that's why my other visual aid here. Let me take the back cap off. You might recognize this as another one of our favorite lenses. This is the, the 50 F2 APO, Apo Sumicron, and it also has that lovely shade. These lenses look very similar. All this one looks a lot shinier and newer than this one, but you can see, well, that's better. Uh, you can see they're really, really similar in terms of the, the design aesthetic now between the the new 35 FLE version two and the the 50 Apo Sumicron. So they're they're really kind of close. They both got focus tabs, they both have slide out shades, and they have that same barrel profile, which which I think is really cool. Although, admittedly, um, I just took both of those lenses to, with me to Japan. I actually took this exact lens and see, it survived. No, no, no. Mm, it's pretty, like, I saw a couple of scratches on no, it the other, no, the other no, day. No, 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 no. It's fine. All right. <laughs> and and uh, a couple times I thought I was pulling a 50 out of my bag and I pulled the 35 out. And a couple times I thought I was pulling the 50 out and I grabbed the 35 because when you grab for it and you're like, oh yeah, that has that round shade. <laughs> it's like kind of kind of confusing. So uh, the other thing, let me stop down here. This is one of the other differences. If you count really quickly, it has 11 aperture blades, which is two more than the previous lens, which has nine, which I'm going to just show the previous lens. And there you can kind of See, it's a little bit more angular and and a little less rounded than this yeah, one that, here. Yeah, you can see that difference there. Sure. Oh, yeah, that's obvious. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's a nice comparison right there. That's yeah. a good screenshot for the next... Boom, screenshot. The thumbnail, yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. So, so that, that's a difference. Also, let's just talk about the shade, for instance. Now, this is... Yeah, actually, let me, let me run through this, and then we'll do a different shot. Sorry. Um, it is 18 grams heavier because reasons... And uh, I'll show you the the really kind of the, the headlining feature here because optically it's the same glass that's in the, the previous lens. What's different now is as we get here and we stop at 0.7 meters minimum distance and you'll see it goes into the gray area because that is now a decoupled close focus range, meaning that it doesn't work with the range finder. But when you have this on a live view M camera or you have it on a M to L adapter and you have it on an SL or an SL2, uh, SL2S, you're gonna be able to use this close focus range. And then you can just dial it back and now you've got a regular range finder lens. So this is perfectly compatible with every M camera, but more compatible when you have live view functionality. And now we get down to 0.4 meters from 0.7, which makes a pretty big difference. Um, Jose, just let's do a close up here without the um, overlay. There you go. Uh, with me. The other one. Hold on. Here we go. All right. That way you can see me talk. Um, we love that. Yeah, we love that. So, <laughs> so here is the two lenses side by side, and I'll give a little top view again. 
And you can see that it's definitely more, more compact. If I unscrew the 3514's screw-on metal shade, now I don't have the finishing ring here, but now they are pretty similar in terms of dimensions with the uh, shade compacted. But this one obviously has its own lens shade that comes out. They both are 46 millimeter thread size, so you can still use the same filters. Just a little easier to change the filters because on the original design, you'd have to unscrew the metal shade in order to change the filter and then screw it back on. And uh, yeah, so this is, again, the big difference. So we've got that shade design, mechanics, the close focus. So this only goes to 0.7 meters and it has no super secret close focus range. On the version two, we go to minimum distance and then we've got that close focus. We first saw that close focus range on this lens, which is the 35 aposimicron. And you see here that stop and then the close focus range. But this one turns a lot farther. So the uh, you, you may or may not like it, but I think most people probably are going to like the... I grabbed the wrong lens. <laughs> gra uh, probably like the more linear feel of of the 35 Sumalux close focus rather than the 35 Apo, which is sort of a logarithmic turn. Yeah. This one, this one feels much more like the original with that little click stop in the middle. I think one thing I want to really mention, you talk, you said it, is the optical design between the FLE and the FLE2 is the same, which yeah. means at 1.4 at a meter, same. they're going to look exactly the same. Mm -hmm. The differences in imaging are only going to come in two scenarios. Number one, if you're using the close focus range on the 35 Sumalux FLE2, yep. obviously you can't do that on the FLE1. Number two, as you stop down, the bokeh will be different because of the two additional aperture blades. This is something we'll dive deeper into on the next show yep. because we're going to show a lot of samples and do some live view shooting in the studio. But if there's more aperture blades, aren't I going to get better bokeh wide open, Josh? You are not, because the aperture <laughs> blades are out of the way when you're wide open. That's right. Um, I haven't tested. I know someone just asked this, and yes. I might also ask myself, this is L-Pro on the FLE1 mm. versus Macro on the FLE. That's something we will also be talking about, because I haven't actually tested it yet. That's um, an interesting idea. Yes. So I have a whole list of things we're going we're gonna to do, and that's why we're going to do a whole 35 Zoom Blocks episode. I have some super sweet, rare, special edition 35s mm. uh, to show on that episode that are just... I just can't wait. Um, so last, let's just show one other oh, thing. Oh, yeah, here. the colors. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So these are the different finishes that we've got. Jose, uh, close up. Yes. Thank you. And we, nice. er, 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 there we go. Yeah, we've got, got black and we have silver. Unlike uh, previous or other lenses, like the 50 Sumalux uh, Aspheric, these weigh exactly the same because they're both aluminum with uh, either black or the silver anodized. Okay, they're both anodized lenses over aluminum. So they weigh the same, which is more durable, maybe maybe the silver, but you know, whatever. Get the one that you personally prefer. I think uh, you don't have to have any weight consideration. Certainly they're the same quality, but yeah. Yeah, so they look great. And you know, the silver on silver always looks nice. Yeah. I, I, gotta, I gotta show this off. Oh yes, it's, okay. the silver on silver is very nice. Go back to the close-up Jose. Very sexy. And this actually has the silver match technical hot shoe cover in it as well, which it just does, adds right to here. the silveriness. Look at that. Put a silver filter on there. We actually have one of those right here. If you want to, you want to show it, yeah. yeah. Let's go all out. And it's, uh, it is black on the inside of the lens shade to cut down on reflections. Although I wonder, you know, will this right here, will that cause reflections if the sun hits it just right? Okay. <laughs> I would hope that the engineers thought about that when they made this. Exotic. You never know. Yeah, and also impossible to get lens. Yet, I don't. I don't. How many have we shown anything that's easy to get? Nope. Oh, yeah. Why would we do that? <laughs> what would the fun in that be? It's, look how yeah. Look how nice that, that combo looks. looks. Very sick. And and it also gives you a good idea how it works with the filter installed. Oh, good point. Good point. And putting the lens shade over it. So that is really really nice. Um, I can give it a good example of why this is a a nicer design. In, in a lot of ways. So let's say that you use a polarizer. Mm. If I have a polarizer on this one, all I have to do is dial this back, dial my polarization effect in, slide the shade out, and keep shooting. On the on the original FLE, I would not be able to do that without removing the lens shade fully. Um, so this is a little bit more practical if you use a circular polarizer. 
again, which is really easy if you're using Live View on an M11 or an M10 or an SL. So yeah, it looks great. And then the black on black version is right here. And that also looks really, really sweet. You've probably seen a lot of the new, you know, M11 35 pictures from Leica tend to be this combination. This yeah. is like the most commonly showed. Well, they always got to show now. what's newest and, and hottest. So right, and that has a uh, thumb support on there too. So yeah. that that looks really sweet. That's a sweet setup. Yeah, really, really nice. Okay. Cool. So, so that covers that. We're actually doing really well on time, which is good. Shocking. So uh, wow. wait, what happened? Are we in a time warp? I mean, it's the daylight savings time thing, right? Must be. Um, Another, well, I mean, we're gonna get more questions about the new stuff, but we're gonna, I'll tangent for a moment and talk about a couple of not expensive things for a few minutes. I don't understand, what's that? All we've been doing is talking about expensive things. Well, the, no, this, uh, here, there we go. That was true, that, this is like, that $8. was like $8, okay, okay. We're on, on the vein of talking about lens caps that happens to be one of my many interests. And uh, <laughs> if, you, if you know anything about me, you know I love a good lens cap. Now, <laughs> if you have shot with any almost any M lens or many M lenses, you are familiar with the 14212 hood cap. This is that little flat, round, not round, rectangular, um, rubbery torture thing. Jose, can we get a close up of this piece of junk? Um, yeah, sorry, a lot of extraneous goobers in the way. So, this is the lens hood cap for the 35 Sumalux FLE for the 21 Super Elmar, 24 Elmar, 35 Sumacron, 20 Elmar version 2, et cetera, et cetera. It slides on like so. And it's cool, but these things fall off like there's no tomorrow. They are just not, <laughs> it's not the best design. <laughs> Look at that, it just fell it off just by fell itself. right <laughs> off by itself. So there is a super cool company in the Netherlands called Octet that is actually now making a, an alternative to the 14212 and a couple other caps that I want to show you guys. This is the company, Octech. And this particular one, there's three. This one is for the 12465 or the 12464, which is the same hood. That's going to be for the, let's see if you can read that, 35 Sumalux FLE version one with hood, 21 Super Elmar 3.4, and the 24 Elmar 3.8. And what's cool about it is instead of being that sort of slide on um, rubber thingy, it is actually an anodized aluminum lens cap with a polycarbonate backing, and it snaps onto the lens like so. Number one, it looks really, really good because it's the same material, anodized aluminum. You can actually hold the lens by the cap. I'm trying to see that here, but I'm holding it by the cap and it's not falling you off. Put your hand under there. And whenever you want to take it off, you just pop it off like that. And what I really, really like is it has a little three-dimensional part, little section here that fits into the cutout in the lens hood that's designed to be a pass-through. Because if you've ever owned one of these for a time, this is a pretty thin piece of metal and can easily be bent if it bounces around your bag. So this fits perfectly in there. You can see it here, so it fills in that hole. It also prevents dust from coming in there too. It does. So yeah. this is, um, again, this is the Octec M cap. One for one two four six five, also one two four six four, for twenty one Super Elmar, twenty four Elmar, and thirty five Sumalux. Super super nice design. Um, they also make one for the version two of the twenty eight Elmer and thirty five Sumacron. Those have the one two four seventy shade. Same concept. I'll show it quickly. It's just that this because the shade is slightly different uh, in terms of the, the inner part. The Octet cap has to be a little bit different, but it looks exactly the same. Functions the same, has the cutout, snaps right on, very satisfying, and you just pop it off. I mean, it's not difficult to get off, and again, fills in that little slot. Super, super nice, anodized aluminum, like, beautiful. Now, they make one more cap, which is not for an M lens, it's for another camera, which has a notorious cap problem, which is the Q2. Now, if you own a Q2, a Q, a QP, Q2 monochrome, any of those cameras, you're familiar with the cap that comes with it, which is this metal aluminum cap that is lined with felt. That is terrible. Um, now, there is an alternative already, which we like very much, made by Match Technical Services. They make the thumbs up. This is the rubber cap. Goes over. Nice. Not the prettiest thing, but extremely functional and very durable. But now we have another option by Otec. Same idea. Show you here. This is the Otec Q cap. 
This is gonna work on any variant of the Q, QP, Q2, Q2 monochrome. And what's cool is it's also anodized aluminum, which is the same as the black uh, Q and Q2. And it has the same little tabs and it snaps into the hood perfectly. Look at that, it looks factory. It actually looks more factory than the factory cap. And again, I can hold the camera. Oh, not this one, almost. I can almost hold the camera by the cap. Maybe not quite, <laughs> but this is not gonna come off on its own. It is super sleek. You can see it just seats right in. Like there's no gap, there's no overlap, uh, overlap just where the tabs are. Um, now this is only gonna work on the lens hood, unlike the Match Tech cap, which is gonna work with or without the hood. So that's something to keep in mind. But I think this is my new favorite um, hood cap for the Q2, just because it's so sleek, it's so nicely designed, super durable, it's very thin. You can slide this in a pocket, slide it in the bag. There was a question about how much, and I see here, I've got- They are 75 bucks uh, for either any of the three. Again, anodized aluminum that comes with this cool little lens cloth. That's worth at least $73.80. Oh, we don't have a, we don't have a link for We're not yet, no, I just added them to the site. Where our first delivery comes next week. They're coming from the Netherlands, so it's gonna take some time. Um, so we don't have them yet, but we're gonna have them. We're gonna have tons of them. I ordered yeah, a bunch. And I'm gonna drop, oh, did you ready to do it? Did okay. you put them to all three? Did you put it to all three, Jose? Just one. Yeah, we'll show link link to the other ones so they can see them as well. Yeah. So again, these are oops. These are by Otex. Where's the third one? There we go. Collect all three. Collect all three. Exactly. <laughs> so I have um, real I wrote the I wrote the descriptions of these on our website. So that was ex if you know me, you know I'm extremely comprehensive. So I did clearly explain what they fit and what lenses they work on and what hoods they work on. So for sure, if you have 21 Super LMR, 24 LMR. 35 FLE version one, um, 35 Supercon version two, 28 Elmwood version two. If you have any of those lenses and you can't stand that rubber cap that just like slides on, get one of these. They're gonna match perfectly. They're gonna fit really well. And uh, yeah, they're super cool. And they're made in Europe. So I've been pleased. I've been using these for a couple of weeks. Uh, nice. I used them first before I decided we were gonna carry them. I actually, I couldn't just say send them. I wanted to try them. Wait, you trying caps and hoods? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I know, right? Unprecedented um, for me to try anything. Oh my gosh. So, if um, there's one thing Josh likes. Yeah, I know. If I love my caps and my hoods and my knickknacks. He does, he does. Um, so, yes. did we talk about all the actual products? I think we've actually covered everything in like an hour and a half, which is amazing for us. Well, clearly the, the two and a half months off has given us a, a very efficient, we've become very efficient. Well, it's Japan. I was telling you, like Japan, everything is like on schedule. So I, I feel like maybe that's it. Um, but there is some other things to talk about. So sure. there's uh, some promotions going on too. Right? Oh my goodness. How could I forget about the single most important thing and nothing else matters, which is... Besides caps? Besides caps. This is almost as important as caps. Almost. <laughs> almost. If you guys have watched any of our 60 episodes, you know that David and I and Jose and everybody who works at the Leica store in Miami are huge, huge SL2S and SL2 nerds. We're shooting almost everything these days with SL2 and SL2S with other stuff mixed in. I think we shoot a lot of them. I shoot a lot of SL2 and SL2S. Now, starting on the 15th of November, and this is for the US, I don't know, I can't speak to the rest of the world. 14th of November. 14th of November, there is a new program in the US for individuals buying new SL2, SL2S, Pop either bodies or bundles, or buying any of the SL Prime lenses. That's one of the five Apo Primes or the 51.4. Yep. It's ridiculous. Now, usually, when I talk about salesy stuff, uh, I'm talking about something that costs $10,000 and blah, blah, blah. This is actually the opposite. This is stuff that's being discounted, which is not a term that's you right. hear that's very right. often in the world of Leica. Hey, Jose, uh, why don't you head over, give Josh the computer screen here. Yeah, there we go. So the SL, uh, the Leica Customer Appreciation Program gives you, short version, $1,300 off SL2, SL2S, body or bundle. The bundle comes with the 24 to 70, or, $1,000 off any new SL Apo Prime or the 51.4. Here are the qualifying products there. Yeah, this is it. This is on Red Dot Forms. So you can check it out um, for yourselves as well. So there you go. if you're thinking about you know, swapping from an SL to an SL2, SL2S, getting a second body, getting your first body, anything, this is a great time. It goes to the end of the year. So you've got a little bit of time to figure out what you want to do. And it's very easy. You just create a Leica account online. You click a button and you get a voucher code and that's it. You go on our website. Um, can you show them that actually, the website, uh, yeah, how that works? For sure. It, all it is is you you put in your discount code, you put in your voucher code. Yeah, right. If you go here to the promotion page. Yeah, this is actually a good opportunity. We can show people Boom. how the- Bundle, upgrade. We'll show them on our website. Once they like, once you get your, okay. your voucher code, because we're not going to log into 
right now. Got it. So um, let's say we go here. To yeah. So find like a SL camera. Yeah. So go and to. You can see that it indicates the the. And the SL two S reporter is not in this program. I can't blame Mikey for that. Those things wah, wah, sold out wah. instantly. So. So the first thing you'll see is there is a code right there. Uh, scroll down. SL Cam 2022. That's going to give you the voucher discount, like the actual act, the reduction of price. So I would copy that code. Did you Actually, that? it applies it automatically. Uh, no, it doesn't. I think so. It doesn't. Yeah. We got to check out. It should. It doesn't. It didn't. No, we tried that. Oh, yeah, we tried yeah, that. Blame yeah, blame Shopify. <laughs> we're, not, Sorry. We're, not that, we're not that smart. Uh, no, but, you you got to copy the discount code. This is it. There you go. All right. So if we copy Add it to this. Your cart. I already did. Okay. And then... Uh, so first, you're going to put your voucher code in the bottom left there. There, see? That's where you, we need your voucher code. So put it in there. There we go. Very nice. If you don't do it, it's okay. As long as we get it, you can email it to us. Check out. Hit check out. And top right, we're going to paste in our coupon code minus the extra space, I think, or it'll still work. And there you go. Ta-da! Ta-da! So thirty-eight ninety-five for a brand new vessel to us in the U.S. Um, this is crazy. So I, I don't want to spend too much time getting all, like, salesy, but, you know, we do work at a like yeah. store. So, <laughs> I mean, obviously, David and I appreciate the support that we get from everybody watching, whether you're just tuning in, whether you're giving us questions or ideas, and also supporting like a store Miami. It does mean something to us. And when we get a chance to actually tell you something is less expensive that's that we good. also like to use, yes, that's a great product. And if you watched the last 60 episodes, you know this. It's cool. We're happy with it. It is. And I mean, especially like the prime lenses, if you want to add a, a 35 or 75 or 90, whatever to your kit, like we've had many episodes about SL, as Josh said. But yes. for instance, I, I use a three zoom kit. I've got 1635, 2490, 90 280. But it's nice because those are all slower, you know, two eight maximum zooms um, to add in something smaller like a thirty five apo or say like a ninety or seventy five for portraits. That's that's an f two. So this is an opportunity to save a grand, which is nice. Or if you want to pick, let's say you have an SL two. I also travel generally now these days with an SL two and an SL two S. Mm -hmm. Great opportunity to pick up an SL two S. So. It's good, yeah. Um, and you can only use it once, though. That, that I should mention that. So the restriction is, you can only pick one lens, one camera, one voucher code for one product, and done. And you know, so what is it like? Limit one per household. Kind yeah, of yeah. yeah. I, it's, these are not bad problems to have. <laughs> batteries not actually. If you buy an SL, the battery is included. The battery is included. Yeah. yeah. If you buy a lens, the battery is not included. That's right. Yeah. So. Anyway, so this is cool. I, we had to mention it. Uh, if you have any questions about how that works, you can look on Red Dot Forum. Check out the promo. We've got yeah. a whole story about it. And you should be looking at Red Dot Forum anyway because, you know, there's tons of cool stuff on there. Um, we should open up the floor to questions since I have... Been I should also way. say keep an eye on Red Dot Forum in the coming weeks and whatever to see if there's any other pending promotions. You know, this time of year tends to bring about uh, those kind of things. So, at least in the U.S. I don't at know least how in the U.S. overseas... They don't have holidays. No, no, they don't do holidays over there. Yeah, we have a lot of good stuff coming. It's that time of year. Mm -hmm. so I can't believe it's almost stay tuned. December, which is mind-blowing. It is. I don't know it what's is. happening right now. I guess we had a long break. So uh, Before we get into questions, I do want to, again, just if you are just tuning in or have recently tuned in, we are going to do our next episode on December 10th. Yeah, I believe that's the date. December 10th, uh, 8 p.m., same time as always, and our topic will be... This and this and this. Yeah, we're doing it. Yeah. This is another one of our, which is I think some of our favorites are anthology, the anthology yeah. episodes, where I'm going to cover. Well, we're going to cover. <laughs> Let's be real. The old, <laughs> the old stuff I'm going to be talking about. The new stuff you're going to be talking about. That's always seemed how it goes. But <laughs> that's why we make a good team. You see, yeah. we're going to cover the entire history of the Leica 35 Sumalux. We're going to talk about them, especially now that there's additions to that. We got two this year. Yes. We got two new 35 Luxes this year in terms of like not special editions, but actual different lenses. And we're going to talk about them practically. So how do they perform both in terms of mechanics, functionality? We're going to do some live shooting in the studio. Yeah. If you've seen our Knock Elk episode, you know what that's like. Got our Oscar the Bear over there. I'm going to do my <laughs> super boring sample test images and then spend time in Lightroom, zoomed in and looking at all that stuff. Uh, I'm super excited about it because... David and I have said many times, we are huge proponents of the 35 Lux. Yeah. And now with two new ones, we can really 
cover the gamut of what those lenses can do. And if you tuned into our Show Us Your Like a Kid episodes that we did, oh my gosh, almost every single person that we showed had one of these. So <laughs> yeah, obviously yeah. we're yeah. not the only ones who have a lot of love for this lens. Very true. And I'm expecting lots of orders to come in for those um, FLE <laughs> caps. They're $75, okay? It's not $5,295. And, and they're metal. And they're metal. Wow. They're, it's, they're made in the Netherlands. How exotic. That's. Or, I don't even know where that is. Is that like in Antarctica somewhere? Do they have penguins? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm not a geographer. No, they, they have Dutch painters. Ah, Dutch masters. That yeah. sounds that sounds very exciting. So and, and uh, riverboats. Obviously, uh, a lot has happened in the last two and a half months since we were on air. This is becoming more common with Leica, where they like to seem to jump to dump everything on us at once and just cause us to get overwhelmed. Personally, I'm quite glad that Leica is continuing to push new stuff out, even though yes, some of the things are hard to get. They're doing new stuff, they're doing old new stuff, new new stuff, special editions, standard products, a lot. So it's been fun for us to yeah. just get our hands on this stuff. I mean, David was in Germany when this stuff came out. And, and I mean, that was my first time back in Germany since 2018. Actually, both of us were there in 2018. Yeah. And uh, wow. I mean, it was fantastic to be on site in Wetzlar for you know a Leica event again. It's been that's four years by my math, right? I know that's yeah. crazy. Four years, the last and part three. It was great to see so many familiar faces, both in terms of our friends at Leica, and it's also great to see that that certain people have you know um, per, how they progressed in their careers at Leica, and getting to catch up with everybody, and um, have have nice conversations, and them basically repeating, "We don't talk about new products." <laughs> it's me... fantastic. I just saw a question caught my eye. Number one, can you apply trade into the promotion? Yes. If you want to trade in some Leica stuff with us, you can still get the promotion. It's not, those two things are unrelated. So you can trade, get the promotion, get save you more for sure. Yeah. Uh, the other question I saw, well, there's two questions from John. Can you use yeah. TL or CL lens on the SL2S? The answer is yes. We have an entire episode about L mount lenses you should check yeah. out. And we also have an episode on the 24 to 70. We do. Which someone asked about. So we have covered a lot of ground because the reality is some of these questions that you guys like to throw at us at 927 <laughs> at night are two hour answers effectively <laughs> to really dive into it, which of course we love to do. So Yeah. Um, yeah. There, always check out, we have archived all of our episodes on Red Dot Forum Camera Talk um, and they are sorted into playlists by the system type and other things. So if you're looking specifically for SL system or L mount lenses or monochrome or M, we've got all that kind of parsed away. Yeah. And a lot of them are time coded. The ones that aren't, we are making a concerted effort to get through our backlog and uh, put timestamps on all of them so you can jump to exactly what you're looking for. And if not, you can always ask a question and we do keep an eye on old, even the old episodes mm -hmm. uh, if you put, throw some new questions in there. Yeah, availability M6, I get it, it's frustrating. Look, we've been doing this a long time and even, I mean, David and I both, but you especially remember when there was no M lenses in stock. Two I years, mean, there was a two year drought we, on M lenses. We had a cabinet, just a little metal cabinet downstairs <laughs> in this building, uh, which are not in the store right now. Yeah. Um, that we kept our inventory and oh it was just gosh. crickets. There was nothing in there. So like four lenses. We, yeah, we had waiting lists for every single, I mean, like if you flew out of a 35 Simicron, you had to get on a list. Yeah. I guess as frustrating as it is, I'm glad it's not the opposite problem mm -hmm. where like it's probably got new stuff and people are going, meh. No. And the challenge is they're handmade. If you've ever had the privilege to go to the factory, you know what I'm talking about. If not, find some stuff on YouTube. The way that they're hand painting the lettering, hand testing, hand assembling, it's amazing. The consequence of that is it takes a long time to put this stuff out. It does. The M6 is interesting because we have precedent here. The MP and the MA, MP especially, have been extremely difficult to get for quite some time. Years. Years. Multiple we years. don't have them in stock right now. I think we have silver MA. That's about it. So I don't think they've magically gotten better at making film cameras faster. Mm -hmm. I think the M6 is going to be like the MP, where it will take several years to the point where they're actually just in stock. And then even then, there'll be intermittent periods of unavailability right? because it's so unpredictable. I mean, the MP has been out for 10 years, more than 10 years. I still couldn't tell you when oh, I'm getting the next one. Yeah. yeah. So here's a product that's been out for 20 years. And if you say, when is the next MP coming in? I have no idea. <laughs> it's just, that's the struggle. And I think that's what makes the pre-owned market so interesting because you have 
50, 60, 60 something years of M, right? 66, 67 years, 67, I don't know. Almost 70 years of M <laughs> to choose from. So Almost 100 years. <laughs> as frustrating as it is that we can't get the new stuff, at least we have access to a lot of other stuff. Uh, granted, I don't think I have any used analogs other than an MA right now, but that will change. Um, you guys keep buying them too fast. Like it's, it's amazing yeah. um, what, and that has been part of the impetus, I think, for Leica to come out with another analog camera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, they see that people are trying in earnest to find these things. They also see in their customer care, in the service department, they see how many M6s are coming in for being, you know, CLA'd and refurbished and, and fixed, which they're happy to do. But, you know, I guess that gives them a, a pretty good indication and read and say, you know what, there seems to be a lot of interest in this camera. Maybe we yeah. should put it out there. I mean, you were selling Leica before they had a digital camera. Not because I'm old, yeah. Yeah, because you're yeah. old. But you remember right. what those days were like. I do. But all we could choose is a film camera. Yeah. It's amazing how that's turned around and it's the opposite now where... Yeah, there was there was, there was was three models. I would love to be able to buy a brand new <laughs> M7. Mm. I have an M7 right here. And not a brand new one. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I, gr I brought one just in case I had to show it. But the reality is the M7 is so different from the other analog M's. It's the only one with an electronically actuated shutter with mm -hmm. aperture priority mode. It's larger... And I mean, I'd I, say that's the spiritual successor or not successor, predecessor to the digital M's. I agree. I actually, some people like to hate on the M7 because they're like, oh, if the battery dies, you can't use it. I'm like, well, if the battery dies in your M11, you can't use it either. <laughs> it's like, what's the difference? I mean, it's a good hammer. The only yeah, difference is batteries for the M11 are $200. Batteries for this thing are like two bucks. <laughs> yeah, so true. if you're that concerned about battery, like, just, just go bring 20 of them and you'll be fine. That's right. I think the M7 is fascinating because of the fact that it has all of the analog feel of an M6 or an MP mm -hmm. with the convenience of aperture priority, which is really, really <laughs> nice. Um, they're just hard to come by these days, especially ones with the MP finder because they made M7s both with the pre-MP finder and with the MP <laughs> finder. So everyone that we get is going to get an MP finder put in, but if you're buying one out there in the world, you need to keep that in mind because the MP finder M7s um, are going to be a lot more expensive and harder to find. So For sure. Um, Again, you could watch our Analog M episode if you want to have a clear understanding of what every single M is and how they differ from each other and how they're similar. Um, that's proven to be one of our most popular shows. I feel like we should do it again. I just don't want to go through the trauma of having to borrow <laughs> 20 different M cameras from 20 different people because I don't happen to have all of them just floating around as much as I would like. Um, uh, yes. They're speaking of analog photography. Oh, yes. Show them the... Talk about that. Ad, that's Adam's hard work. We have yep, to yep, thank yep. Adam for bringing in a bunch of new film brands to the store, which David will navigate to. I will attempt to. Because we have certainly ourselves seen the uptick in interest in film, and we want to start carrying more of it. Just don't ask me what they do, because I haven't shot film in... More. Well, and as the interest in film has grown, there have been more both re-entries into the film market, where... Previously, discontinued film stocks are being reintroduced by mm -hmm, their mm -hmm. pers respective brands, mm -hmm. as well as new entrants like Cinestill and Japan Camera Hunter and the like. Under accessories. Under accessories. And then film. Just click on the main category. Yeah. Boom. Okay. Uh, you zoom out. Well, we see what it looks like on the screen. Okay. There we go. There it is. Yeah, so we have uh, a whole bunch of some some new films here. What's the new ones? Let's see. The this one, uh, Roly Blackbird One Hundred is is pretty new. This Amber uh, T Eight Hundred is new. We've got Portrait Eight Hundred, and still, you know, the standards, the Four Hundred uh, Tri-X, Ektar One Hundred. Again, that's one that's been reintroduced. Ektar went away for thirty years, and now it's back again. So, twenty years. Uh, I used to use Ektar. 125 and 100 and Ektar 64 back in the day. And now there it is, Ektar 100. Um, but, you know, Triax never went away. Ilford HP5 has kind of been around. Portra's still been around the whole time. And then we've got the Cinestill, uh, the 800, the double X, and, uh, and... A lot of the stuff is in stock, which is convenient. Some stuff is out of stock. Yeah. Also, the really handy-dandy uh, Japan Camera Hunter film cases. And I should mention, you can come back to us, I should mention that... Um, we had the pleasure of meeting up with uh, Bellamy Hunt. Well, I wasn't there. 
we had the pleasure of meeting up with Bellamy Hunt, uh, <laughs> actually at a at a really cool camera store in uh, in Tokyo called um, Kitamura. Kitamura Camera. Come, I know the name of the store, and you were the one that got to go while I was. Because my brain is not. It's somewhere sitting around with one useless hand, somewhere crying uh, about yeah, it. Yeah, so we met at, at uh, Kitamura Camera in Tokyo. Uh, met up. So Bellamy Hunt is Japan Camera Hunter. So it's kind of interesting to put the you know kind of the the name with the face and uh, the handshake. So are we doing another Japan workshop next we year? We are doing another Japan workshop next year. So that should be, again, we'll probably be in uh, November timeframe, which is when all the beautiful color is. So just email Peter. If you have questions about that, Peter at like a He is the mm-hmm. workshop guy. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he's watching, but. Um... And it was, by the way, a fantastic trip. A big shout out to the, uh, the folks who went on the trip with us. Great group, great fun. I mean, you know, these trips tend to go quickly, but it also felt like we were there forever. Um, <laughs> in, we, in the best possible way. In the best way. So, yeah, you know, we, we really explored uh, Tokyo and uh, the, the Izu Peninsula, which is beautiful, staying in these uh, traditional ryokan, soaking in onsen hot springs and going to Kyoto and uh, Nara. Did you and bring me back that. any sake? No, we drank the sake. <laughs> Unbelievable. Sake it to me. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Start deprived. Well, I learned also... The Japanese do not drink warm sake. It's like anytime you ask for warm sake, they're like, "No, cold." <laughs> really? So, yeah. I don't. Know. Eat a lot of rice. Okay. They're very timely. You, the trains run. You could set your watch by the uh, the, the trains. Yeah. So. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, the images on the participants when they start. Absolutely. When they get over their jet lag and start processing. Oh my gosh! Because... If, if everyone is like how it feels <laughs> like I feel. Yeah, they're exhausted. Wow. So, yes, I mean our, you know, Peter is constantly adding new workshops. They're constantly filling up. Some faster than others. And if there's destinations you're interested in, you can reach out to him and again, Peter. At like, well, I'm, I'm going to tease a little bit. Oh, I'm going to tease because okay. I just had a conversation with with Peter yesterday about this, where we were setting some tentative dates for the fall. So if you're looking to set your calendar and join us on some of these trips, we're also making the trips a little bit smaller, a little, a few less people, so we can have just a little bit more elevated experience and you know less crazy at restaurants and hotels and vehicles and things. Um, we are going to we are we're planning out our fall schedule. We're talking about our Colorado fall foliage trip again, going from Aspen to Telluride. Are we going to do New England? I'm getting there. Oh, okay. I'm getting there. Hold on. Hold <laughs> okay, on. Okay, sorry. I was like, wait, Colorado. Okay, and that's going to be in September. Um, astrophotography in Moab again because that was a big hit, mm-hmm. and everyone always asks about astro. So astrophotography oh. in Moab and Arches National Park. And also doing, uh, we haven't done this in a few years, kind of like us going to Germany, but um, New England fall foliage. And we're actually going to roll it in a little bit different variation. In the past, we've done separate trips to different areas. And we're actually going to do a combination of the Maine coast and uh, New Hampshire fall foliage. So that's going to be... Well, what's the most important part about that workshop? Hmm. That the two of us are going to be there. Hmm. Yeah. As far as we... As far as, as, far as we, we know. know. Yeah. So and, that will be... And Colin. And Colin. So if you want to hang out in the woods with me and David... And, and lighthouses. <laughs> and lighthouses. Uh, now is your chance. Well, not now, but eventually is your chance. Yeah. Uh, because that's a workshop that we have done together a couple of times. It is. And, it is. And uh, I, feel like, I feel like just for tradition's sake, just don't ask me to parallel park. <laughs> I don't know if Mark watches these shows. I don't think so. <laughs> That's what I remember. Those workshops are super Josh fun. Josh actually had to get out of his car. Yep. It was a minivan, okay? I'm not used to such a large... And and one of our video. participants slash longtime friends... <laughs> That's a parallel park the car like, for me. He's like, Josh, get out. Yeah. And he took over and he... And the spot was huge. I mean, it was huge. <laughs> Arts, yeah. I don't know how I have a license. It's Josh really... is a car guy. He, he is like... I can't parallel park. I do better now with my GTI um, than I did with the giant minivan. Because GTI is like this big. Yeah, well, it's, and it has a backup camera too. So It has back. But anyway, so yes, we have a lot of stuff coming up. Um, and also we're fitting in. And then Peter, while we're yes. doing that, will be in Scotland oh, in nice. the Hebrides. So got we a lot have of stuff like up. all the things. 2023 is going to be a good year. It's going to be epic. Um, I, I'm gonna tr- I still haven't put together my like nerding out with Josh workshop. I'm going to do that. I'm going to try to bring back some of the boot camp programs as well that are camera specific workshops. I have a lot of ideas for next year. Um, it's just a matter of getting through the holidays, <laughs> surviving the beautiful Florida winter, and doing from there. We should do Cape Cod. Uh, to answer the question, what gear is better for Japan, M11 or SL2? Yes, I shot both. Because why not? There we go. Mainly, you can't ask him that. Right. But mainly, I did 
I did shoot this combo right here, which is the, the M11 and the 35 Lux. I also shot a bit with, as you know, I have to, my 18 and 24 Super and regular Elmar, uh, as well as the uh, the 50 Apo and a 90 Simmerit because I'm I'm big on using lenses that you can't get. Um, and then, <laughs> but I also brought an SL2 and a 2490, which was also fantastic. So using like an M11 with a 35.4, and then an SL2 with a 2490. Especially there were some places we went where it just you know you got to be quick mm -hmm. uh, because there's just people like a river of people coming through and blocking your picture that you want to take. So being able to quickly change cameras was was really handy. Somebody said lobster rolls. I remember the first time I had a lobster roll was with you in Maine on the water, and I was so excited, and I was so disappointed. Like, lobster roll is the most boring food. Just cold lobster on a roll. But do you remember the, uh, oh. was it the, oh. the, the lobster Ex Benedict, though? That was good. Yeah, that was. I'll take that. Give me yeah. some hollandaise sauce. That was in. That was in Lincoln. Maybe Park. that's what. Maybe that's what the lobster roll was missing. Maybe that's what, <laughs> hollandaise. You got hollandaise sauce. Uh, so we're we're tangenting dramatically. <laughs> Sorry. Any other uh, questions? Scroll up. Does seven have a couple of magic categories? Yes, it does. We can. We talked about that in the analog show. But yeah. Uh, are they going to make an octave for the thirty-five Apo? Probably not, just because there's so few thirty-five Apos out there. But I agree that that lens cap leaves to be desired. Yes, I will show pics from Japan after I have my brain back yes. in my head. And... Give the poor man a break. He spent four weeks in Europe bouncing around, <sighs> working, and then two weeks in Japan? Ten days? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was only home for about a week between yeah. Yeah. Europe and Japan, yeah, yeah. so... It's been... Uh... Time zone blender. Yeah. yeah. I'm but, fine. But it's been... <laughs> but certainly fantastic. I loved being in Germany and catching up with everybody, and the Scotland workshop was incredible. Um, shout out to, to the... Uh, folks who came on Scotland. There was absolutely weather in Scotland, which was great uh, because that's what makes it <laughs> Scotland. Yeah. And uh, just a lot of fun, a lot of scotch. And we set a record there. Oh, yeah? We had the youngest participant on a Like a Storm Miami photo workshop ever. How old? 17. 17? 17. Wow. Uh, Eli, if you're watching, you're 16. You got to come on a workshop. And she was the last person to leave the parking lot. Nice. At the end hotel nice. because she didn't want it to end. I love it. And she said, this was my favorite trip, vacation, whatever, that I've ever taken. And listen, that's 17 years of experience. They're hanging out with you. Hanging out with all of us. <laughs> she enjoyed the crowd that's and so the group. Cool. That's and, amazing. You know, I think that's... And, and she... Listen, she dealt it out as, as well as she could take it. So, like, she... Gave everybody crap, <laughs> and everyone gave her crap, and it, it was like it's so cool. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun, Very nice. and shook things up a little bit. Um, so that that was a lot of fun, and um, the workshops and, are cool. I mean, great. I don't go on most of them because I'm here in the store answering your emails every day. But, <laughs> but you should go. <laughs> so I, well, well, I'll be in New England. Yeah, I mean that's like a workshop that I personally love, sure. and uh, it's something that we've done a couple of times. So yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. That will be a workshop that I am on. Otherwise, I am I am going to try to plan some stuff in the store. Um, Definitely should do year. stuff in Miami, yeah. Yeah, I want to do my like nerding out workshop. I just haven't had the time um, to really put it together. That's on the list for probably January. We have anything going on? Norway. Right or Norway. Be Norway. Well, you'll be in Norway. I won't be in Norway. And then yeah. Kirsten and I will be doing Norway uh, in January. Okay. But until then, I'm pretty available. So we can do more camera talks. So. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, that's... I mean, we... It's it's harder and harder for us to do shows. The busier David, and busier we get. With David's travel travel schedule and all the things happening, but yeah. you know we're doing our best, and and uh, I'm excited for the next one, the 35 Simulux episode. Actually, what I'll mention is, if anybody watching has like a super cool mm -hmm. edition, uh, limited edition 35 Simulux, something vintage, something current, um, anything did, like that. Why didn't we mention that? I'd That's be happening before our next show. To borrow it. What? Thank you. Thank you. Um, JPM says, does Leica Store Miami do anything for Art Basel? Thank you so much for asking mm. because we forgot to mention two things. This is how I know Kirsten's not watching because our phones will be blowing up yeah, right now. Fair point. One, Leica Store Miami has been a founding uh, sponsor? sponsor, supporter of the Miami Street Photography Festival mm. since it started eight years ago, I want to say. A while. Eight years ago. Yeah. Um, they didn't do one last year because of the world, but this will be the first year in two years, coming back and having an actual event uh, in downtown Miami at History Miami. And we will be participating in the Miami Street Photography Festival. It is awesome. It's fantastic. Uh, speakers are legendary photographers. 
uh, the likes of uh, Alex Webb, uh, Bruce Gilden, uh, other Is people. Maggie there? Maggie Stieber. Yeah. And many, many others, too many to name. Um, they are, are great presenters, and you can go to all their lectures and presentations. The exhibition and the photography, the, the class of photography that you see at, at the final exhibition is absolutely mind-bogglingly good. I wish I was this good of a street photographer. <laughs> I can't even, like, I would never even dare to enter this because <laughs> it's pretty impressive. The quality of the work yeah. is outstanding. Yeah. Um, and it's just really fun. It's really cool to connect with people. There's a lot of photo walks uh, going out in Miami and getting to hang out with people and actually enjoy like the good three months of weather in Miami, uh, which is the first week of December. So that's coming up uh, just in a week mm -hmm. and a half-ish, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and we will definitely be participating in that. And so the thanks. other thing that's happening on November 30th that's right. is uh, a you, new gallery show. And not only a new gallery show, but who is the photographer that's showing the world famous uh art wolf so uh, a lot of you probably know who art wolf is we had the pleasure of working with art quite a few years ago now peter and i did a workshop with art in um seattle in the pacific northwest or, yeah, in Washington, yeah. uh lake quinault in the um quinault rainforest which is an olympic national park and he was just a fantastic instructor, fantastic presenter, and of course, an amazing photographer. And what's what's unique about this particular show, it's called The Human Canvas. Um, his background, even though he's, I mean, very well known for his photography, both his photo books, his fine art prints, his wildlife photography, his work with National Geographic, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The, um, the Human Canvas is, is really fascinating because his, uh, his formal education is actually in painting and, and fine art. So he brought this back around and is using people, like people, models, to paint on and paint the backgrounds and take the photos. It's pretty wild. It, it's amazing because if you look through the book, there's a, a really good human canvas photo book. Which we sell. Which we sell. Um, <laughs> it's on our homepage. But if you, if you look through the book, you would swear that this is Photoshop. Yeah. And I can guarantee you, because I've spoken to Art, and I've spoken to his digital tech, and they assure me, zero Photoshop. There's no overlays. This was all done in real life. And he shot it all on the like S system, which is kind of the tie-in here. And uh, it's... Workshops and events. Right there. Yeah, yeah, and there it is. So if Jose brings that up. You know, it's basically stuff like this. This is, this is real. These are really seven people lying on the ground that he painted every single one of these. And the background. And the background by hand yeah. to make these really fascinating um, designs. So this is November 30th in the store. So if you're in Miami, if you want to come to Miami for free drinks to hang out with all of us, the whole team will be there. Art, Art, Wolf. Art will be there. Uh, he'll be doing book signings, et cetera, et cetera. There's the dates. You can RCP right there on our website. Um, it's going to be awesome. I'm super excited. It's Plus free. the weather's beautiful this time of year. So for sure. Yeah. Pretty cool. Sure. Wow. Okay. We covered everything. I don't see. I, I feel like we are just very comprehensive show. A lot of new products. A lot of news to talk about. Um, any other last minute questions we need to address? Uh, Rick Wise, it's an epics. Sorry, I forgot to change into a real watch. <laughs> I've been. Uh... I just realized that about twenty minutes ago that you didn't have. But it's fine. We're we're we love all things. <laughs> wristwear not necessarily have yes. to be swiss yes this I mean, is uh, it doesn't have to be swiss so i'm judging you but i don't know i don't even know where this is made probably china but <laughs> but it is uh don't worry i got it i got mine covered so we're good but it is titanium and ceramic and sapphire so you know see there you go <laughs> i know david has to have all of his metrics available listen you can't you can't manage what you don't measure i see this is like the this is like david's info button like on the m's beep, you beep, just beep. press right. it and he tells you how much it, it, it tells how me much, how much battery left how, how remaining but space is left in the hard drive <laughs> <laughs> oh, ridiculous. Um, all right, I think we did it. We did do it. We can end a little bit early. Barely. Listen. For once, as opposed to going three hours over or whatever. Wow, this is fantastic. Yeah. So uh, thanks for hanging in there. I do have to apologize. We should bring up Jose on the camera here. Oh, poor man. So poor is Jose had a little bit of a... Oh, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> sign language or something, please. No, no. Um, Jose had a little bit of a, um, a microphone situation here that um, unfortunately being cobwebs in the studio and all, the uh, the microphone battery just was uh, not alive. We'll make it. We'll fix it next time. But we will we'll fix it. Do like a twenty minute rant. 
Yeah, he's going to do a monologue yeah. next time, and it's going to be fantastic. But Jose was here in mind and spirit and body, just not in voice. So uh, you can you can all wave at Jose. <laughs> there it is. You still need there it. it Don't worry. Okay. Uh, he actually did have some really interesting information about the 35 Sumalux. But the good news is our next show is about 35 Sumalux. It so is. I'm going to make sure Jose gets his shot. Yeah, we have to check in with Jose because he's now shot some video projects with the 35 Sumalux version 2. And they're really cool thoughts, um, especially given his perspective of how much he shot with other lenses in similar scenarios and how it's different. So you definitely want to stay tuned and make sure you remind us if we do not give yes. Jose the mic. We won't forget. I won't forget. Yeah, we got to make sure that he talks about that. So big thanks to Jose, as always, for keeping all the angles straight, especially we had all the different slides and information today. So big thanks to Jose. Everyone give a shout out to Jose. And if you're in the US, I uh, hope you have a great Thanksgiving. If you celebrate it, that's coming up next week. We're going to be closed for a couple of days, yep. but we're always around. If you need us, we're back on December 10th for our 35 Sumalux episode. Uh, obviously, any questions in the meantime, we have email, we have YouTube comments, you know how to find us, yep. we're around. And until then, we're just going to hoard all this. That's stuff. right. This is all for us. Can't have any. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We all did right. it. Thank you, guys. Um, thanks to Josh. Thanks, to Jose. Thanks to you for watching, because uh, without you, we wouldn't have any reason to be here. Very true. Otherwise, we'd just be staring at ourselves. Um, and we will see you on December 10th. In the meantime, uh, make sure to subscribe to Red Dot Forum YouTube channel if you're not already. Click the notification bell so you know when we go live. If we have any surprises, we might do that. And uh, check out red.forum.com for the latest like a news, reviews, and more. And until then, we'll see you next time. Have a good one.